Um, I cordially welcome all of you on behalf of Sure Network and Delta Metropolis Association to the second edition of Next Generation Podium for Euro Delta. Everybody can hear me and uh, is active. Perfect. So um, the backbone behind this symposium is an efficient consortia from City of Amsterdam, The Hague, Province of South Holland, Delta Metropolis Association, and Brown Urban. Probably the uh, consortia members can just get on the video and say hello to everyone for a couple of minutes. Just a quick hi to everybody. Hi. Perfect. Everybody can hi. see? Yes. Hi. Great. So I'm Alankrita Sarkar. I'm a spatial planner and project leader from uh, Delta Metropolis Association, and I welcome all of you on behalf of Shore. I'll be moderate. I'll be the moderator for today's session, and um, I have a whole team here from the consortia, but also some of the organizers who are here to help all of you with any technical issues or with your questions or chat box. So you can feel free to drop anything at the chat box anytime. Uh, before we begin, quickly, let's go through some uh, uh, house rules. Please note that the session is being recorded and we might be taking some screenshots or photos during the session. We re would really like it if we keep an active interaction and your videos are on, but if you really don't want to be in a picture or something, please, um, please feel free to switch off your video. That's completely okay. Um, other than the speakers, I think now everybody is muted and that's good. So when the speakers are talking, there should not be any extra sounds coming in. It's a one and a half hour session and we will try to finish it at th uh, 1 30. Uh, for, as I mentioned, all your questions can go to the chat box, but if you want, you can also do uh, a raise hands from uh, below, from the bottom of your bar, uh, Zoom bar, but you can always put it up in the chat box. I'll quickly share my screen. Give me one second. Great. So can everyone, everyone see this? Perfect. So um, we have a whole week of symposium program planned for you. Today is just the first day. We will have three lunch forums, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and uh, two workshop days for the participants. The viewers are very much welcome to join us on the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony on Thursday and Friday. Um, so we look forward to have a great session the whole week. If everything is being uh, organized via Zoom, but uh, we are doing some physical sessions at City of Amsterdam, Boer as part of uh, Sweco in Louvre, Belgium, and uh, Metropole Ruhr Business um, at SN Germany. These are some open office days being organized by our supporting partners. And if you are anywhere nearby, these cities, you can still register and uh, visit these offices to get to know the work, to get to know more methods of working, of planning, and how a city, a metropole region, and uh, a design office work in cross-border discussion. Um, our focus, uh, our focus today would be on water management and climate adaptation. This is the first lunch forum, and we will also be looking into a little bit of sure network agendas and what kind of um, uh, what kind of work we do from sure network what does it mean about euro delta for all the new people who are joining um, one quick thing malvika do you see um, martin kaysen in the list right now yes Okay, perfect, because I'm receiving some email from him about the link, so that's why I'm checking. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, 
We have uh, four eminent speakers today. Martin Gissen is one of them. We have Cedric, we have Scipio Koch, and we have uh, Peter Kalbach. Um, I will introduce each one of them in uh, on time. But uh, before we um, uh, go further, I would really like to mention again that we really want an active participation from the whole audience. The presentation part is really small, but we really want to better discussion and come up with good ideas in the last half an hour. Um, in today's program, uh, we are uh, we are really going to look into the Euro Delta part as well. This is something that we will discuss much more in the opening ceremony on Thursday. But just to show you quickly, what does Euro Delta mean and what does uh, Sure Network means? Let's look into a short video. Global population has been shifting more and more from rural to urban regions, and also across regions. Approximately 45 million people live in a highly urbanized region, known as the Euro Delta, with a vibrant economy and a strategic location surrounded by the Rhine, Meuse and Scheldt. The region has the potential to become one of the world's most developed and sustainable mega-regions. It is our planet's biggest spot of light. That's why the Sure Euro Delta Network was created. To seek cross-border cooperation within the European network of metropolitan regions and to contribute towards stronger partnerships among cities and regions within the Euro Delta and beyond. By focusing on exploring opportunities for the region, and knowledge exchange with members of the Metrix network, the network explores how the cooperation in the Euro Delta region can benefit all inhabitants. The Euro Delta is a vital economical hotspot of the European Union, where not only a joint history and values are shared, but also similar challenges exist today. And when such challenges are tackled in cross-border collaborations, Innovative opportunities and creative ideas are created for the region as a whole. Through this network, we can explore new ways to achieve a harmonious economic, social and territorial development. This enables us to come up with innovative solutions that align with the policies of the EU Green Deal to transform the EU into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy. Join us in building a more sustainable future for our region. So if you are hearing the terms Eurodelta, Shore Network, Cross Border, if you are hearing these terminologies for the first time, please use the chat box and shoot your questions because all the experts of Shore Network are sitting in the meeting and they can they will be happy to answer your questions on these. So if you're if you have any further questions, I'm not going into detail, but you can always use the chat box for that. The three pillars of Shore Network is practice, research, and academia. There are a lot of projects going on and that you can see in our website, uh, in the website of Shore uh, Network. It will be in the chat box in a bit. And uh, today we are talking about Next Generation Podium, which is a program aimed to create an academic focus on the discussion of cross-border and mega-region challenges. The aim is to promote the involvement of young generation planners and designers in the development of Eurodelta to bring in new perspectives. But this is also something which we feel that uh, this can bring more inspirations for the practitioners in the field. So that's the reason we want innovative ideas, out of the box ideas from our next generation of um, urbanists. We had a successful year last uh, uh, event last year in 2021. This was the first time we organized Next Generation Podium and these are some glimpses, but you can al always see the complete results through the link. Uh, we prepared this vision catalog, but over uh, 60 uh, to 80, uh, 60 students or uh, young professionals worked on 10 different visions and they prepared the uh, what how how Eurodata should be visualized in coming 50 years. So this is something we are going to work on for all the participants on 
Thursday and Friday, but with more inputs and more uh, variety of questions. Uh, to move in further, uh, we have a short interview with uh, Cedric Fito. Uh, Cedric, uh, let me, uh, yes. Sure. Is it, is it spotlight? I'm trying to spotlight you. I don't know. I cannot yes. see it anymore with the shared screen. Yes. But uh, uh, Cedric is the design strategist uh, at the European Commission and working with New European Bauhaus. Thank you so much, Cedric, for joining us and helping us understand um, what New European Bauhaus is in a much better way, in a simplified way. Uh, please uh, give us a short introduction. Um, so the New European Bauhaus is an initiative launched by the European, the President of the European Commission, um, which, uh, to make it simple, to connect the EU policies with the EU citizen. So as a citizen, when we hear about the Green Deal and all those policies, it sounds something very far away. So in a way, it was um, an initiative to call all the cultural sector, the um, creative sector, designers, architects to get involved and to, to, to follow the Green Deal and to be active on this uh, climate change uh, challenges. Okay. So um, to, um, let's say to simplify now the initiative itself, I would say it's a mix of bottom-up approach. So the idea is that mm -hmm. we as a unit, as a New European Bauhaus team, we are trying to gain, to understand the good practices from the EU citizen across the EU. And so we are trying to, to get all this knowledge um, through different uh, mechanisms, through different initiatives. And then once we get this uh, knowledge and we can co-create, we develop new learning. And those learnings, then we are able to share it back to both the EU citizen and the EU policy. So there are a bunch of different initiatives yeah but uh, let's uh, let's quickly check how many of us uh, does have have you guys um, from the participants have you guys heard of new european bauhaus before let's uh, do a quick poll there is a poll coming up can you quickly answer everyone who has heard of it never heard of it very brief information or there are some organizations who are actually working on it extensively because I'm joining from Delta Metropolis Association and we are an official new European Bauhaus partner. So we are really trying to develop the program and the agenda from our end. Uh, let's uh, see quickly how, what is the feeling from the audience today? So I see around 76 answers. Um, and uh, almost 50% uh, uh, says that never heard of it and 40% says that they have a brief information and there is 10% who is saying that we are exten extensively working on this agenda. This is uh, coming from around 82 participants. So probably we have much more deeper to go, Cedric. We have <laughs> more answers from you so that everybody can really enthusiastically work on this uh, uh, agenda. It's a beautiful setup. It's something that we are, as a spatial planners, we are looking into it and we understand the scale side of it, but still how to actually implement or address the agenda from our own projects, that's always a big question. So you already mentioned the connection with new European, uh, with European Green Deal. Can you elaborate on that a bit further, that what is the key link or what is the key connection between Bauhaus and Green Deal? So the New European Bauhaus basically has three visions. So it's sustainable, together, and beautiful. Yeah. So sustainable is, of course, the clear link with the Green Deal and the climate change uh, work. Then the beautiful is about the aesthetics, both as a cultural artistic, but also as a designer for the experience of uh, an activity or a place, etc. And then we have the, in the together, which is the inclusive approach, of including everyone on the on our initiative. So those three values are um, interconnected, of course, and 
the idea is to develop activities that have those three values. Uh, they work together. It's not one or the other. We cannot be sustainable without being inclusive. So um, those are the three main values. Yeah. So sustainability, aesthetics, and inclusions, the three values. How can the young generation of planners and designers or researchers who are most of the audience for today or for this symposium, from their projects, from master studios, from their research that they are doing in their universities, how can they contribute to these uh, values? Uh, it's a complex question. I think there are different ways. I mean, of course, I always want to start saying like uh, get involved as a citizen in uh, policy, politics, in the in those uh, lot of. Um, activities ongoing to get involved. And I think it's very important to develop this uh, experience and learning. But that's more like my personal, uh, maybe uh, activist side of talking. And then I would say, I mean, <clears throat> if it's about the new open bar house, and I see also on your framework, you're talking about the SDGs, for example. So the SDGs is quite uh, central on indicators and a lot of um, metrics that you can follow. I would say the new Panda House is mainly based on those three values. And so, of course, those three values can be understood differently by anyone. So yeah. that's and what how you do you link this with the scales? Because we are here to discuss about the cross-border uh, uh, issues or the cross-border challenges that we have, and speci specifically from Euro Delta, so the borders of Netherlands, Belgium, west of Germany, north of France. What kind of, uh, like, how does this impact a bigger scale or is it more about the local scale when it comes to Bauhaus? Okay, so there are a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say just for the, the young people who want to get involved, um, they can also check the price and the festival. So there are activities where they can get those learning. We are actually launching the public vote of the prize uh, today, I think. So you may go and check on the website to read those case studies and get inspired by them. And the festival is going to happen in June, uh, mainly in Brussels for the first edition. So there are also a lot of activities to get involved on the, on the New European Bar House and to learn more. And then we have, have also launched uh, two weeks ago, I think, the New European Bar House Lab, yeah. which is um, an initiative that is connecting the different partners that we have. So we have developed our own community of practice with partners, such as you, um, where basically we are co-creating the initiative because as we mentioned, we want to be a bottom up. So we want to co-create with the people on the ground. Yeah. And so the NebLab initiative is going to be open for a mix of partners. So. Uh, I think it's a minimum of uh, three partners. I, I don't, I'm not working specifically on that, who can start to experiment on the ground about one specific issue. So at the moment, we have five NEB lab activities. There is one called the uh, NEB Girl South, which is a um, partnership between partners from Portugal, Spain, France, and Italy. And basically, they are universities, and they realize that they have similar challenges in the South such as climate change and um, inclusion, migration, etc. So they are working together on that. So of course, um, in the um, in the Delta region, similar approaches can be can be launched. Yeah. And so that is about collaboration, about working on the ground, but also working on the broader scale. And uh, if I because uh, of course the. Uh, Master students, young professionals are joining today, but also quite a lot of um, audience today is from the cities and regions, which is a part of Sure Network. So how can the government authorities or the agencies can be a part of the discussion? What is their way in to address new European Bauhaus? So um, we have developed the, this community of practice. So we have the partners, which are for non-profit yeah. uh, universities, and we have now the friends which are for for-profit uh, co companies and for um, municipalities and regions. So they can also get involved uh, within the community, raise their voice, and help the partners to develop, to host activities or to sponsor activities. So um, yeah, they can get involved. And there is another network that we have launched recently, the 
national contact point. So now we have one contact point for every country of the EU where we can they can also get in touch and have more information about what's happening on the on their own region. Okay. One last question from my side, and then we probably pick up some questions from the audience. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, please put it up in the chat box uh, while I go through my last question. So uh, how does a human centric uh, centered design play a role in this European agenda of a new European Bauhaus, because it's something really talks about the whole EU. It looks like quite a policy discussion, but uh, how how much it is human centered in the design discussion when we talk about local projects. Probably I have found out that yeah, you are a founder of another initiative as well, uh, human humanitarian uh, designers. So how can you link this to, and can you tell us something about this? So about the human centered approach, um, this, the, the, the team working on the New York and the house was um, the employees were originally based in the policy lab of the commission, and they were applying service design methods for uh, foresight uh, trends and behavior of uh, students. So they were you know, they, they had the, the expertise of design and human centered approach. So, of course, it's a complex work to, to be done to connect with the youth citizen because we are a team of what, 15, 20 people working on that. And that's why we are mainly thankful and uh, working with the partners because they are the ones who are going to spread the message. So, it's always a tricky point where, of course, we want to have a human center, we want to get everyone's feedback, but then we also need to leverage through the communities and then they share the message. So we try to facilitate that as a community management kind of approach. Yeah. So it's really bottom up and more action oriented from every individual who can be connect themselves with this agenda. So it doesn't have to be in a structured way or in a top down approach. Yeah, we try to, to develop mechanisms and uh, initiatives that uh, allow this uh, sharing of feedback. Because every time we open one, we receive 600 applications, and so we are three people to analyze everything. So um, we need to, to be smart on how to launch uh, all of this. Okay. Okay. The idea is to always check out the feedback from the user. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cedric, for this brief introduction of New European Bauhaus. As Shore Network, we really think this is an important agenda for us to look deeper into and to work and address this agenda we will keep trying our best to do that in future continue doing the same way is there any questions from the audience anybody wants to ask anything from cedric no Okay, so if you don't have the questions yet, we will still have time at the end of the discussion, so we can still bring him back in the discussion and uh, we talk about it. As a next uh, part, I would uh, like to move to our next speakers and introduce uh, Scipio Koch. Uh, he uh, will be giving the first presentation. Uh, he's a strategic advisor from City of Amsterdam and he's will be presenting a very innovative approach of creating awareness of the um, in Amsterdam of uh, climate and environmental challenges. Next, we will have Professor Martin Kaysen from Faculty of Architecture, Keo Louvre, who will be telling us about a cross-border initiative on water and climate agenda. And the last presentation from today will be Peter Kalberksik who is an architect at a transnational office, City Foster, presenting another design approach of water management. Uh, can we have them on screen? Great. Uh, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, Peter is for joining us from City of Amsterdam. So yes, there is the team of Amsterdam. We can see everybody. Hello. Uh, uh Great. So, uh, Scipio, let's start with you. You can share your screen and give us a quick introduction of yourself a bit and then the presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alankita, for your, for your kind introduction. 
Let me start by sharing my screen and asking if everybody can see the correct screen. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, ve I'm very happy to be here and to present uh, to you today, although it's digitally, it's uh, still nice to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the mayor's manual. And um, uh, I hope that my story today uh, um, can bring a benefit to our common situation. And how we can do that is a question I would like to answer for you today by telling you a bit more about the why and the how behind the mayor's manual. But first, a bit more uh, about myself. Um, as Alain Rita said, I'm uh, Skipier Kok, a strategic advisor for the engineering department of the city of Amsterdam. And for the most part, I give advice to asset managers about issues regarding the future of our city. Um, and more specifically about how we can make the assets that make up our city uh, future proof. I work mostly on long term issues, which is about 25 to 100 years. Um, and I do that, among others, by producing and sometimes hosting the Mayor's Manual podcast. And I'll tell you a bit more about the Mayor's Manual. Um, because in short, we are a knowledge sharing community, which is built around the podcast. We started off as a podcast, but as you'll see in a bit, it became a bit more. Um, and we focus on solutions for urban challenges in the built environment. And we collect advice for mayors worldwide, but it's, it's kind of a metaphor for everybody who works on cities. Um, and we do that through the, uh, through the podcast. So, so far we've made 42 episodes and one book. Um, and we did that together with over 90 front runners from government, industry, and uh, knowledge institutes. And the podcast is uh, a co-production by, made by three organizations, which is, of course, the City of Amsterdam, uh, the Amsterdam Institute for um, Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, and the Dutch Enterprise Agency. And you can find us on any major podcast outlet, but I'll give you a link at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and I think to better understand the mayor's manual and our mission, it's important to tell you first a bit how we are positioned within our own organization. And we are part of the Future Proof Assets Program, which is a program um, uh, started by the city of Amsterdam and in which the city of Amsterdam collaborates with, among others, but mostly the Advanced Metropolitan, uh, Advanced, the Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, also known as AMS Institute. And um, the goal for this program is to find um, more effective and efficient ways for stakeholders to uh, cooperate and to innovate in order to create climate adaptive and climate proof cities. And we hope to do so through affordable and sustainable action. And in this program, I've mentioned uh, um, it's a program in which stakeholders uh, uh, innovate and cooperate together. And we do so in a organized forum, which you might be familiar with. It's called the, the, the Triple Helix Model for Innovation. And our logo is a reference as well to this Triple Helix Model. Um, and we do so with many different stakeholders, uh, many of which are, are you, you, can, you can see here on, uh, on the slide. Um, and uh, collaboration between knowledge institutes and business partners is, uh, fairly new in our sector, the infrastructure sector in the built environment. And triple helix collaboration in which we are all an equal partner, uh, which is a less juridified way of working together, is also uh, a fairly new. Um, uh, and this is, this is sort of the context in which the mayor's manual operates. So if we go back to the mayor's manual and we take a look at our mission, which is uh, inspiring thinkers and doers to accelerate urban transitions by creating a deeper understanding of solutions to urban challenges. And these solutions can be very specific, can be solutions, uh, technical solutions, which is locally applicable, uh, but it can also be um, a more of a solution direction, such as an approach to systems change or um, the social acceptance of transitions. So we cover a wide range of solutions um, within the mayor's manual. And I think for now, it's, it's important to focus on the why. Um, why do we think it's important to focus on a deeper understanding or better said, why do we focus on uh, creating a deeper understanding of solutions to, for urban challenges? And firstly, that starts with, and I don't think this is a new insight for many of you, 
uh, but the scale and the complexity of the challenges that urban regions face is uh, getting bigger and is already uh, quite big. Um, and the, 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 there is an increased importance of safety in urban regions. And secondly, cities have always been a, a, a hub for uh, knowledge development, uh, knowledge spillover, innovation, um, and just general, yeah, you could say urban buzz if you like, uh, thanks to the diversity of people and the diversity of stakeholders and due to its uh, scale of space and the political cloud cities hold. Um, and regarding the many challenges we now face, um, many of which are man-made as a result of uh, how we have done our work for centuries. And when I say we, I specifically also mean uh, the sector I work in, so the infrastructure sector. Um, uh, and um, uh, it is a bit cliche, I think, to reference Einstein, but I'll still do it. I believe because I believe it's uh, Einstein who's credited with saying that it's insanity to uh, do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Um, and although he probably was not thinking about climate adaptive measures or subterranean cable complexity issues, um, I think it still rings true because if we want a different uh, or a better outcome, we have to change our ways. Um, but to change our ways, um, we need to know where we want to go, and, but we also need to know how we can get there. And this is the focus of the mayor's manual. So that's not only the podcast, but in general, the knowledge, the knowledge network. So how do you or how do we create this long-term perspective um, and the understanding about how to make this long-term perspective happen? And please forgive me for using the following uh, image and badly adapting it, but it is about finding the unusual suspects. The unusual suspects are the front runners from government and industry, um, and also from the knowledge institutes, and it are the scientists, the policymakers, the students, contractors, entrepreneurs, um, let's say representatives from many different backgrounds and areas of expertise, who have new ideas about doing business, um, and have the ability to change our current ways and to change the way we build uh, our collective public built environment. And I think many podcasts focus on these change makers and we are very happy that that's the case. Um, and we try to do our part by focusing on the front runners with solutions for the public built environment um, of cities and then try to leverage our position within the municipality and within AMS Institute to create change and to, um, yeah, yeah, to create change. Um, and um, an example of an innovation that truly has used Amsterdam as a stepping stone for scale up and what we uh, like to use as a blueprint for our work within the Future Proof Assets Program is a Project Smart Roof 2.0. I don't have enough time to go into it um, uh, too long. So please look up their site. Um, and the image on the right hand side is a artist is an artist impression but blue green roofs are now being built at a large scale throughout amsterdam uh, throughout the entire region and also internationally so that's a true success story um, and our task is to distribute the knowledge throughout our organizations to spread this knowledge about the solutions which as i said varies from specific technical solutions such as uh, water retaining roofs or water retaining sport fields um, two ideas about system change for integ integral solution finding. Um, and we have to spread that knowledge among those who matter, which are the people designing and building uh, the city, which we call the mayors for, we for whom we are writing a manual. And we believe our system works, but we also know that to make it even better, we have to make impact and we have to make more impact, bigger impact. Um, and that's when, uh, where we arrive at the difficult step, translating our action, um, our actions into true impact. Um, and that's where the mayor's manual, uh, again, becomes part of the bigger picture I sketched out at the beginning of this presentation. Um, uh, and we did, so, we tried to do so by linking our vision for impact uh, to one of the more pressing challenges our, current, our sector is currently facing which is that we have to transition from newly developing all of our assets to mostly maintaining and um, most of the time one-on-one -on -one replacement of our assets. This is a way of working in which we as cities, um, we as municipalities and all our stakeholders are not used to innovate and create progress towards reaching our goals. 
Um, we're used to innovate within new sp specifically cordoned off projects uh, and are often scared for the difficulties and inherent failure costs of innovation. So to do so for us is quite a challenge. Um, and therefore we have proposed a, um, a way to innovate within the regular maintenance, bus uh, maintenance uh, uh, budget and replacement programs of our organizations. And this proposition, which is a proposition uh, not only made by the team of Future Proof Assets, but all the people um, uh, collected in the Future Proof Assets Consortium, is to do that with 10% of the budget. Commit 10% of the budget and time and effort allocated for regular maintenance and replacement towards innovation investment. And to do so, we have to find again those parties who do things differently in our sector, which is a sector that historically is very well known for doing the things the same way over and over. And that brings me back to my starting question. Why am I here at the Next Generation Lunch Forum with the podium for Euro Delta? And that is believe, uh, of course, uh, because I want to tell you something about how we do our work, but also to instill on you all the importance of sharing your um, innovative and inspiring stories, views and ideas, um, your insights you have for how to create future cities and lead the way towards creating these future-proof cities. Um, and to do so, I would like to end my story with, uh, with our call to action. The call to action is also part of the mayor's manual. And that is that our cities can't wait. We have to think big, um, act courageous and be courageous and take bold action. And um, one step back again is if you want to share your story um, or your way of making impact, please do so. And also please know that you can do so through me and you can contact me at the email address posted here. And if you want, you can download our book for free at the website. And then I think Alankita, it's back to you. And I'm very interested if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Kipio. This was really a good overview. I have gone through the book, so I understand you had to cut down a lot of details because of the 10 minutes time. But probably one thing I would like you to mention, because there are five domains that you talk about in the book. And the fifth domain is really very important for this group, which is next generation. So the question is, what can you tell us just specifically about that uh, domain from uh, Mayor's Manual? what next generation, um, how the next generation can play a role? Did yeah, play? yeah, sure. Thank you for your question, because that's also the domain we specifically added um, uh, because we think it's, uh, it's so important. Um, uh, you can't see, but today I'm working from uh, the AMS Institute, um, which is not only a research institute, but also a, uh, they also have a master, uh, the MAID Master in Metropolitan Analysis Design and Engineering. And uh, I interviewed a lot of students past year uh, about solutions they were working on for, for uh, current problems and future problems. And what we keep finding is that the, the, their view on problems um, uh, has, doesn't have the limitation of too much expertise yet. And uh, we find that linking their knowledge and their views to the current problems we have and giving them the opportunity to, to do so through, for instance, living labs, um, where they can put their, their knowledge directly into practice, gives results um, uh, that you don't find easy when you just, um, in, within regular contracts, let, let's, let's put it like that. It's, it's very difficult for us um, uh, to uh, innovate um, uh, constantly in, in regular contracts and working with students makes that a lot more easier and not only students, let, let's say next generation, yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's the aim that we are also trying to do through the cross-border discussion. There is one question in the chat box. How did you start with the idea on uh, Mayor's Manual? So where did it initiate it? Yeah, um, I think with an idea that many people have, and that is that you're having very interesting conversations that other people need to hear. So maybe that's a bit, uh, a bit of hubris, but uh, um, uh, my boss contacted me and said, I'm having so many interesting di discussions we should record them and, pub, uh, uh, and publish them. Um, so we first did a lot of thinking, okay, what, what is then an interesting angle and how can we make it uh, into a show that people really want to hear? And then, um, yeah, that was the, base, the, the, the basic idea, all the interesting stories we already had by working with our uh, Triple Helix partners. Yeah. 
Thank you, Scipio. I think there is one more question, but it's really more into the content side. Hello, Hans. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can put up your question directly. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, do you want me to ask it? Yes? Yeah, you can, you can hear, uh, you can ask the you question. Can hear me? You can hear me? For Scipio. Yeah. Okay, so uh, hello, Scipio. Uh, First of all, it's a great endeavor what you are trying to do here. This is really immense. I understand that completely. Because uh, in our, let's say our history also of Amsterdam, we have a lot of uh, uh, stories about density. So the density policy is, uh, is already for, the, for years there. So now my question is, how does your uh, endeavor relates to the uh, current density policy, that's one. And of course, the maintaining and the developing of green blue structures, especially in the old city. Yeah, um, Hans, I'm not, I'm not completely sure if I understand the first part of your question. I'm not familiar with the term density policy. Uh, Verdichting. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, let's me, let me ask oh, okay, you. Okay. So, okay, so, so, so you don't know maybe? Uh, so uh, the Dutch government has said that we have to, if it, uh, if it comes to new housing, we have to find places in the cities, yes? Yeah. So the new houses have to come into the city. Yeah. So uh, the obvious uh, question is, uh, is uh, how does your endeavor relate to uh, the replacement and the maintenance of... Uh, yeah, of, 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 of current structures. Of, of, yeah, of, of, yeah, of the mayor's manual, because that yeah. seems to be uh, contradictory to the mayor's manual. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I think a first important thing to note is that we focus mainly on public infrastructure and that uh, we also have some utilities uh, departments within the municipality, but they are not part of our scope. But I do think there are still are lessons uh, coming from the mayor's manual that apply to um, uh, the density policy. Um, I think um, uh, new development and renovation don't necessarily uh, exclude each other. So I think if you uh, renovate in a smart way, uh, there's probably still room for uh, creating more uh, densely populated areas or maybe to mix new development together with renovation. But um, the mission we are on is um, uh, linked to the direct challenge we see that most of our assets we, we have to maintain. And so that's where the demarcation between utilities and assets, when I'm talking about a sluice or about a, a, a quay wall um, uh, that has little to do with density policy, it's just that we have to maintain this asset and we have to maintain it for the next 100 years. And that's the, that's the current challenge. So I think then that way it's a bit difficult for to relate my story to your question. Mm -hmm. um, but you had a, a second part of your question as well. I'm trying to scroll through the questions to find it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how, how does this relate to uh, maintaining and developing green blue structures in the old city parts, especially, yeah. especially when we look at climate change and the cities are getting hotter and hotter and let's say uh, the people of low uh, income, etc., they live there, so they have extra problems. And then we, if we only uh, focus on streets, uh, then I think we are missing uh, the point. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Hans, I, uh, uh, skip you. I'm sorry to interrupt. We pick yeah, this question long, and we stop here because we move to yeah. the, we have to move to the next uh, uh, presentation. Ah, I understand. But uh, I think this is also a question that will be discussed by Martin Kaysen as well, as well as Piotr. So the next two speakers are going to talk about the uh, blue and green and blue infrastructure. So I think uh, probably oh, so, we can so, pick up yeah. this discussion after their okay. presentations, then it can okay, be good. more okay, good. Thank, you for your, thank you for your question, Hans, and I'll be there yes. in the last part of the table discussion as well. Maybe we yes. can pick up the question then. Thank, okay, you. thank you. And I thank see you. another question in the chat box. Puria, we pick up your question after the presentations. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kipio. We move to Martin and then You're we welcome. come back to you together in a, in a panel. Hello, Martin. 
Hello, Valenkrita. Thank you so much for joining. I would just say that you can start your presentation and probably give a short introduction about yourself. All right. Um, Thank you. PowerPoint should be on the screen now. Um, yes. Let's, let's, let's first briefly introduce myself. Uh, yes, my name is Martin, Martin Hayes, and I work at the University of Leuven. Uh, I recently started there as professor, but at the same time, I'm still working in practice. So I have like a, a dual position and I've been doing this already for many, many years, working both in practice and in uh, academia. And the uh, work I'm going to show today is a bit this mixture as well. It is both from academia and from practice. And it's dealing with uh, the question of uh, yeah, it's Les Pas Bleu, the, the blue space. Actually, the, the, originally it was the blue green space, but it will come clear in the, the presentation itself. Um, first of all, I want to situate a bit where we are working. Uh, this is a construction which is called the Euro Metropolis. Um, it is actually one of these cross border uh, European. Uh, collaborations uh, dealing with Southwest Flanders, uh, Wallonie, and the north of, uh, of France. And in fact, this is a collaboration of uh, 14 uh, public governments in one body. And they're trying to discuss, trying to find out what they can do together. Um, this one has been founded, I think it's already 20 years ago. Uh, and at first there was the idea that perhaps the, the, the mail, the letters could run faster from one side from the border to the other, or maybe the trains could go faster one side from the other. But in the end, these are not the topics we're, uh, we're dealing with. And in the end, uh, the question we had, uh, or the reflection we had is uh, that there are a few items that are connecting us across these borders. Uh, it has to do with culture. There's a, a culture of uh, making giant statues and using them in this uh, carnival uh, parades. Uh, but also the water is one of these elements that simply runs across borders. Uh, this is one of the little unifying elements that we have in this cross-border co connection. So the idea of creating a kind of blue park, a kind of uh, blue structure, running through the borders, connecting one to the other has become uh, one of the main lines of the Euro Metropolis to, uh, to deal with. And as you can see on the timeline, it's already a long time that we are working on this one, uh, 2004, uh, even before the Euro Metropolis was uh, founded. It was founded in 2008, I see on the slide. But already in 2004, there were like the first ideas of, uh, can we do something with this blue? Uh, can we do something with this idea of the water that is connecting us? And throughout the years, this became more and more crystallized. It became more and more clear what this uh, blue park could mean, what this blue park uh, could become. There are a, a, a number of lines that we're uh, dealing with, a number of reflections we're dealing with. Um, this idea of uh, the, the Blue Park has been documented in a, in a publication that is freely available at the Euro Metropolis. Uh, and it deals with, like I think, more than 12 items, how we can build this park. Because making a park on a territorial scale is not the same as making a park in a, in a city. I mean, this is a completely different figure. And I think the metaphor is quite interesting that you build a park on a territory, territorial scale. By this, you actually mean that you are making like one city, a territorial city, I agree. But it reflects this idea of making a city, making something that connects one to the other, connects one across the border to the other. So this idea of uh, the park is although it sounds a bit strange to have a park on that scale, is quite fruit fruitful and I think also quite powerful to actually express this idea that you're unifying, that you're bringing things together. Um, the blue park, I will translate it because yes, we're working in this French, uh, Flemish connection. So there's, it's always in Dutch and in, in French. English is actually not an official language in the Euro Metropolis. So it's a bit strange always to work in this uh, bilingual uh, context. But in fact, they are doing six things at this point. They are building a website uh, that also contains a, a map with all the projects. They are uh, focusing a lot on, on bicycling and also on the blue walks, literally uh, walking along the, the water. They recently created the uh, Carré Bleu, which is the, 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 the blue square. Uh, actually, this is a cycling path of more than 90 kilometers along the water. They're investing a lot in the culture uh, with the water and the blue park. And uh, we're working also a lot with summer schools. Uh, and there was just a question on uh, how to deal with students or how to work with students. This is actually the mechanism we have set up to work with the students, to work with this next generation, to bring them in this, this reflection of the blue park. So these are like the six main lines of thought that are uh, happening since uh, I think six, seven years. And there are some results already. Uh, there is a, a guide that has been made to uh, a guide that has been made to to cycle along the water, uh, a map that has been made. So this is like a touristic product uh, to discover uh, this blue park. There are these walks that have been uh, made uh, by, by a lot of people. And this is like, uh, this is one of these micro projects by the European government that is funded. Uh, and this continued even uh, nowadays, these uh, blue walks. And it's very 
fine to see people that are participating. Suddenly you meet people in a very specific context uh, that you would never meet. And there are always local guides explaining something about uh, the space in itself. So bringing to the, to the fore this kind of idea of the locality is very important in this, uh, in this Blue Walks. There is this uh, blue square, the Cari Blue, the Blower Road, the cycle path of 90 kilometers that has been uh, realized. It has been, there were a lot of signs put up. There is a co whole connection, a whole uh, also kind of uh, commercial aspect on this one to, to connect, to create, to build, to, uh, to unify up, uh, across the borders even. And there's this whole idea of building this park by uh, simply picking up all small initiatives that are uh, going on, bringing them together and communicating them. So again, this making this park is actually not about investing and constructing an, an actual park. No, this is about uh, unifying, bringing together, connecting, communicating, and actually creating a kind of, you know, like I often call it this kind of product that is being brought to the, to the exterior. One of the ideas in the uh, academic uh, we have, or in the more academic reflection we have, is that this blue park is one of these uh, federating figures. Uh, this blue, this water, running through all sort of things. This is a historical map dating back to the uh, 1862. Uh, but this idea of the water uh, is actually the unifying element, the federating element. And we are uh, focusing heavily on this idea of the federating element, because again, as you see on the picture, there is a French speaking part and a Dutch speaking part in this, uh, in this image. And the water thing is the one thing that connects uh, all, these, uh, all these territories all this culture and all these people one to the other and for this we're building this park and we have done some reflections on uh, in the summer schools dealing actually with uh, a lot of uh, layers and levels of uh, what is this water and this image you see in a very abstract way i agree <laughs> but you see actually the, the groundwater tables that are running through uh, again and there's something very particular in the north of France. There is no, uh, there are no small creeks. There is no, there are no small water bodies. But there is a lot of uh, issues with the groundwater table. And if it doesn't rain a lot in the north of France, or if the water is, is not infiltrating there, we have a lot of issues in Flanders with uh, an absence of groundwater. So again, this is a, this kind of idea of uh, relating one to the other, how uh, uh, the water is connecting us across the border. And to deal with this uh, water system or this water reflection or this blue park and the, the academic uh, reflection, we have actually split it up in, in these three levels. The groundwater uh, table, the, the, the one that is underneath everything. There is a sec second layer of reflection is dealing with the small creeks, uh, the capillaire, the really the small non-navigable uh, waterways. And then the, the corridors, these are the main water uh, arteries. Actually, these are the navigable, navigable uh, waterways. Uh, that are structuring in, in a very uh, profound way this whole territory. And we are always reflecting on these three scales simultaneously, connecting them one to the other uh, when dealing with this reflection on the, on the Blue Park. What does it mean that we have organized since 2016 a series of uh, academic sessions uh, called summer schools? Uh, at first, they were dealing with uh, each of these uh, layers separately, the, the corridors, the main waterways. At first, in 2016 and 17, we dealt with the small creeks uh, and in 18 with the, the groundwater table, bringing together students from all over the world. Uh, on the top left picture, picture, there are students from Turkey, from Portugal, from Spain, from you name it, uh, that were actually like embedded in, in these small municipalities uh, during more than 10 days and dealing with this idea of uh, what is the water. Cycling was quite important in this uh, territory because it's quite flat and Flanders is known for uh, its cycling activity. So students were also forced to cycle through the territory and to go on visit and make actually some reflections. I'm not going to elaborate this one fully, but what I mean with the slide is that the summer school is actually embedded in a year tra trajectory we're dealing with at university. So we work more than a year to have the summer school uh, installed and in place. And there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of reflection and a lot of work done on uh, changing this whole water system. In Flanders, we have a water system that is draining uh, easily the water towards the rivers and the water is gone. And we are slowly adapting this whole water system to a system that actually retains the water, makes it, buff makes it buffered, but also let it in infiltrate to again have this ground water tab table uh, being feeded. But to adopt the system, we need a lot of space. We need like more or less 3% of the surface that is being uh, dedicated to this uh, water management system. So we need to redo the whole territory in a very profound way to have spaces for infiltration, for buffering, uh, for reuse. And what is interesting is that the summer school is a kind of a mechanism to uh, go from very abstract uh, ideas on uh, what is uh, water could be, what this park could be, with this kind of provocative uh, images uh, with sunflowers uh, along the fields. But afterwards, we work in the design studio. We make it more concrete, we, and uh, we actually uh, start to detail it. 
the summer school brings in this kind of very abstract ideas of what this uh, what things could be but in the reality we are, we are also building with the practice uh, very actual projects uh, on it and this one is now being executed uh, this is the adaptation of one of these creeks bringing the creek back to the surface because now it's completely underground and at the same time uh, making public spaces on it so what i find really interesting for this next generation if i may call all of you like this is actually that you are uh, contributing to a reflection on a territorial scale and making and building new spaces and i kindly invite you can, I kindly invite you to check out the website, to see the Parc Bleu uh, website and really to see what we are doing, what we are dealing with and how important student work is and working with students is in, the, in this kind of context to provoke, to think on and actually to create uh, new spaces. And this is in a nutshell, 20 years of work <laughs> brought in uh, approximately 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Martin. This is really a great inspirational project for the uh, next generation, but also for the sh for sure network. Probably, I hope to collaborate in a way that next uh, mm. year we can go for a side visit to the park with the whole students, and I hope to be able to do that together with sure network. Um, any questions in the chat box? I see that some impressive presentation, some. Uh, greetings coming in that's great perfect so if there are any questions you can put it in the chat box let's pick it up after the last presentation from today um, together with all the speakers in the panel uh, I see one more no this is just an answer but okay we pick up the last presentation uh, thank you so much Martin be here for another 10 minutes and then we uh, wrap up together as a panel uh, Thank you, Peter, for joining in. Um, I think uh, you can just start right away with a short introduction from your side and uh, with, you can share your screen for the presentation. Yes, thanks, Ankita. Maybe first, just to check a bit on the audio. Can you actually hear me yes. well? Yes. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Yes. Yes, so my name is uh, Piotr Kalbarczyk. I'm working as an architect at the Office of City First Architecture and Urbanism. It's actually a German-based office started in 2005. Uh, I graduated two years ago and uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. I guess I'm just going to show a bit from point of view of, uh, let's say, young designer working in architecture and urban design office to show what kind of assignments we are busy uh, within our practice when it comes to water management and, uh, and safety in regard to, to the water topic. Uh, so I was actually asked to show a bit on our uh, last year project, research project we've done for the municipality of Rotterdam about Marconi Plain. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will try to show a bit how we actually arrive in our design process from infrastructure or infrastructural spaces to actual public space uh, that concerns not only safety, but also the quality of the public space. Uh, so in this particular project, what is probably also worth to mention is that we collaborated with landscape architects of open fabric and mobility, mobility experts of move mobility. So I think I think it's also quite uh, important to stress and underline uh, that those projects and assignments we're dealing nowadays with, we are actually as architects or urban designers not capable to kind of uh, do by ourselves. And we also need this expertise and uh, multidisciplinary collaboration in order to tackle all those challenges. Um, so this particular project, Marconi Plain, it was called uh, in the brief as a bottleneck. It's located in the western part of Rotterdam, on the edge of the city between Rotterdam and Schiedam almost. And as you can see on this drone image, it's basically one huge uh, traffic junction with multiple traffic flows actually connecting from all different directions. A public transport of a, a, a bus stop, tram station, and actually a metro line that goes underneath that. It is a very vast space. It is potentially the biggest square of Rotterdam or biggest public space of Rotterdam uh, that one could get an assignment to design. Uh, however, it is also almost running away in the sense that it's, it's that big that it's very tricky to even define the edges of that. So in this sense, one of the major topics we're dealing 
with uh, in this research project was actually a bit of a philosophical question of is actually Markov plane a square that is defined by, in, uh, by its edges in a more traditional sense, or is purely a, a transport hub that simply allows a very efficient change from one mode of public transport to the other one. Um, so, and what is also relevant to mention is that, uh, yeah, there is 50,000 cars passing by every day through, through this particular location, uh, but following the, the ambitions of the municipality, we, uh, or Rotterdam as a municipality, wants to get away from this very much car-oriented city to much more pedestrian and bicycle-oriented one. Um, so in its whole analysis, Marconi plane, as we defined it at this very moment, is a simply a transport dominated void between different district, districts without really much of an identity. And its public space is a mere leftover of what happened, what happens on the top of that. But in regard to the water topic, what we also learned, and it was extremely interesting to work on this project because what we learned is what lies underneath Marconi plane is actually the primary dike of the Netherlands uh, and is one of, if not the most relevant dike for, for uh, Netherlands and for the lowest line delta in the world. Uh, it is part of the dike that uh, protects three and a half million people and possible breach of this dike would probably cost around 37 million of euros. So very long, very short lesson on, on let's say the dike system in the Netherlands uh, Rotterdam is located somewhere in here, and this particular location of Marconi plant is a dike of the ring number 14. So the whole Netherlands is uh, basically divided into different rings of dikes, and based on their importance and how much, let's say, they're protecting in terms of investment, but also how many people live in there, um, the dikes are assessed uh, or they have different safety standards. And in this particular case, we're talking about these, the, the highest standard of a dike. And so a one that can be breached only, the chance of this dike being breached is only one in 10,000 years. Um, and perhaps maybe to show you or tell you a bit of my experience working on this project is we obviously had as architects and urban designers do a lot of homework and it was very much a very steep learning process of to kind of uh, also understand the whole system of dikes behind it and what it means for the public space. Uh, but I think it's also extremely interesting to see actually and be more conscious about the Dutch dikes uh, because as it's actually claimed in this kind of uh, Bible for know-how about Dutch dikes, uh, flooding has not claimed a single life in the Netherlands for more than 60 years. And it has to do probably with, it has to do with the fact that uh, in the 50s, actually, there was a big flooding uh, which killed almost 2,000 people. And since then, uh, Delta programs and the room for water, the room for river programs are actually working quite well. So, what this meant for us is actually uh, was about embracing this topic of Marconi Plain being first and foremost actually an infrastructural place that has to defend millions of people. Because as we learned, uh, the, the Marconi plane will have to, the dike that goes to Marconi plane will have to be raised by two meters. So it is currently at around uh, five meters above the sea level uh, and will have to be raised to seven meters above the sea level. So this was actually our main spatial challenge to see how can we actually uh, change this transport mode, change this public space into a qualitative public space. Uh, for the city, a new hub for western part of Rotterdam, but also how we can do it by raising it by two meters. So in this sense, we are really trying to explore this idea of a performative dike of infrastructure that also serves the people, so can be programmed. So basically what we propose is that instead of, let's say, raising only the part of the dike, which obviously in its footprint is much smaller than the whole Marconi plane, which is marked by those red lines, we raised the whole podium by these two meters, and this allowed us to kind of program the edges of the dike in different manners. 
so what we proposed is this performative diet that dependent on the context and kind of the district that is facing, uh, it propose, proposes new additional program. Uh, for example, on one of the sites where we were dealing with the polder area that is already six meters lower than the, uh, than the actual life, we proposed a sloping plaza that would uh, also give a direct entrance to the metro station because now what happens is that one has to climb on the top of the dike to kind of go back down to the metro station. Uh, so on, on this side, we kind of opened up and uh, try to capitalize on the ambition of the city to, to promote the public transport more. On the other side uh, uh, of where those almost kind of um, symbolic towers, Lee Towers uh, for Rotterdam are located, raising the dike, dike by two meters allowed us to actually propose a new uh, program underneath it which in this case would serve actually this whole neighborhood as a kind of scale of a boulevard, which would be retail spaces or kind of exhibition spaces for a lot of interesting developments uh, happening in this area. And in the end, what we decided is that actually Marconi Plain is uh, neither a central city hub, but it's also not a suburban hub that serves only this kind of transition from one public home to the other. Uh, but it's a mixed city hub, so it is also a space where one potentially could uh, spend some time at, uh, and it also just kind of serves as a new pivotal point for western part of Rotterdam. Um, and what we did basically is to, that we used also kind of our traditional tools of uh, drawing uh, uh, the so-called Schwarzplan of kind of using also the tool of densification to try to uh, uh, grab the edges of Marconi Plain to define those, uh, but also we looked very much at this space how after simply kind of cleaning it up from all this uh, messy uh, different flows of mobilities, uh, it could become a much more of a nice place to be uh, that celebrates very much, let's say, public transport uh, and serves for a very efficient kind of change from one transport mode to the other. It's not so much more uh, car-oriented, or it's not car-oriented at all, uh, and gives kind of enough um, presence to it uh, for the new uh, West uh, city center of Rotterdam. And just very briefly, to put it maybe in a bit wider context, uh, I think what is also interesting to understand, maybe also as, as a starting point of this symposium, is that uh, we're dealing with actually an area or a river dike uh, that has to deal with these water challenges that, uh, that are coming from the river basin of, of the Mass River. And this actually, what was actually already just mentioned in the previous presentations, is quite often water is the only connecting element between these different countries. However, the policies quite often just end at the edges of the, or at the borders of the countries. So I think it's quite interesting to also see Marconi Plain, uh, the dike going through Marconi Plain as a river dike uh, of, an, of a river mass that actually starts uh, much farther away from it. Uh, and also just kind of this in the context of uh, Netherlands uh, dealing extremely well with potential flooding risks, uh, but actually uh, flooding management still being a very much topic on agendas of uh, all countries of Euro Delta, also Germany and Belgium, with, uh, with the sad story actually happening last year in Germany, uh, in the area of R and, and Eiffel, where it simply, uh, yeah, seem that the, the system simply failed. And so we are to kind of show it again, maybe from designers perspective, we're dealing with very different contexts uh, and with very different kind of challenges uh, to other projects. I just want to show one slide and that is that although uh, we are also busy with a framework plan for the federal district of Bonn, which is also next to the Rhine River, actually there we almost had a luxury uh, I would say to deal with uh, a specific uh, park area that also works as a buffer for the river, which would simply kind of allow us to focus on the, let's say, uh, urban design plan in, in this context, or as other topic, again, actually back to Netherlands, another research project we done in Enschede, 
just on the uh, German Dutch border or very close to the German border, where we actually didn't deal so much with the flooding risk, uh, but we also dealt with heat island effect and we uh, dealt with uh, more of a longer drought periods that are occurring in these regions. So in this particular project, what we were discussing, and also one of the topics was mentioned already about the blue green roofs, we actually looked into a, a, a design, a urban design for a business park in this case, that would allow to actually disconnect the rainwater management from the public storage system, but it would also allow to create enough rain buffer capacity for a hundred year drought. And this is perhaps uh, all the topics I wanted to mention uh, that I guess uh, when graduating as an architect, I wasn't uh, really sure that I will have to deal with such some, some such complexities that are, how, are, however, extremely interesting to work with in the architectural and uh, urban design profession. So that's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. I think this was really a great learning process for everyone to connect with, uh, create a connection between the scales that how to start from local scale and what kind of challenges are we facing at a mega region scale or the cross border discussion. But at the same time, you actually talked about the cross sectoral relationship. So how water is connected with infrastructure, climate, but also with the space. So I think this is something which is which should be taken as a big learning from today and uh, what the students will be working or the participants will be working on day four and day five. I would really ask uh, everyone to switch on their videos and get onto the panel and start having some question answer session. I can see that uh, some questions are already being answered by our um, speakers in the chat box, but if anybody else wants to say anything, please join us here with your video. Puria and Hans Decker, you asked some questions. Yeah, I see. So Yes, Puria, you want to ask? Can you? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, first of all, for not having my uh, video because of some technical difficulties. Let's say uh, I had a question from Martin and I asked it in chat because it's something that also we are working uh, right now on it. I wonder what's the connection of the Blue Park and the whole idea to the agriculture sector that is mostly active in Flanders in the terms of water pollution and how can we uh, integrate these two different programs uh, adjacent to each other right now? Or is it any part of the project addressing this question that's uh, in the term of water management, what are the strategies to do so? Thank you. A difficult question. and. Uh... <laughs> Especially since the the Euro Metropolis is not working with focusing too much on agriculture at this point, and I think you have you raised something quite important: the relation between pollution and, in fact, biodiversity uh, and, and the water. And it's on the agenda, but it's not actively on the agenda at this point. Uh, and we know we have to start working on it, but it's not there yet. So um, yeah, I think it's an open thing we still have to have to manage. So thanks for raising the point, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Although we worked already for 20 years, uh, we should start dealing also with the, with the agriculture. The fact is in Flanders is that uh, one out of six jobs is actually uh, related to having access to uh, high quality uh, and enough water. Uh, so there's an enormous economical dimension as well which is related to this blue park. Uh, but also that one, we were not able to put it on the agenda yet. Um, as I wrote down in the chat, we uh, at this point we have um, aimed at these kind of yeah, low-hanging fruits, the leisure uh, and tourism uh, elements, and now we started working with social inclusion, uh, but also the biodiversity. So we're slowly getting getting there, but maybe within five years, I can tell you more about that one. Thank you, uh, Wendy van der Horst. Uh, do you want to say something about your question? Yeah, of course. Um, so thank you, Martin, for um, your very interesting talk and project. Um, 
Yeah, so I, and you already answered it in the, in the chat, but I was just wondering sort of how successful um, uh, the, the identity part of, of your project has already been and um, how you would manage to go from this territorial skill that is so easy to plot in, in maps to something that actually feels sort of livable and part of our space. And also in order to integrate these larger themes like biodiversity, climate adaptation, and um, get them on the agenda with the, with the local communities, let's say. Mm -hmm. the, the, and maybe this has to do also with the structure of the Euro Metropolis. It's in fact, this is a collaboration of 14 governments. Uh, so they have, in a way, they have an enormous leverage. And at the same time, they have very limited means. They are not investing themselves. They are always relying to one of these 14 uh, governmental bodies to do the investments. And I think it's the strength and also the weakness of the Euro Metropolis that they are on the one hand, able to put things on the agenda to bring uh, people together. They, in a way, coordinate this kind of uh, bringing people together, but at the same time, they cannot execute projects. And I think that's the whole duality on how can you uh, engage local municipalities, local governments, and so on, to do things that fit in a larger agenda, that do frame in this larger agenda of working with the Blue Park. Uh, and at this point, we're working with this kind of very, how to say, uh, small-scale, low-cost uh, means of doing this. So we organize like a prize of the Blue Park. We have this Blue Walks. So there is this constant uh, awareness rising uh, that, that this all relates one to the other. Uh, but it's not that we are, are able to design a whole park or to invest in a whole park like, like what is done with the uh, IBA Emscher. This is simply impossible. We, are, we don't have that kind of means. So we have to invent the kind of way of working that on the one hand puts things on the agenda, but is being executed by others. And uh, I think over the years, there is this slow awareness rising. People start to know what the blue space is, especially now with this blue walks and cycling thing. This is the, the, main, uh, the main way of prom promoting the whole stuff. But also there, there's a, still a long way to go to build this park and to see what this building can be. And again, these summer schools, they uh, also are part of this awareness rising. Local municipalities start to understand what we're doing. So slowly, we are getting more and more uh, outreach, but also there, I think within five years, we will be further in the, in the work to be done. It would be different if we had like 10 billions to spend, but uh, yeah, we don't have it. Thank you, Martin. There's a question from Syed Jishan Hussain. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, first of all, thank you for all the presentations. They were really very informative. Uh, I have actually two questions, one for Martin and one for Piotr. Uh, so maybe I'll go first with Martin. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, like, when we talk about blue and green infrastructure and the way now we perceive them as way different than what we used to perceive them back, like maybe five, seven, ten years back. And we are trying to be more innovative in, in this way. So uh, is there any way uh, uh, or any proposal uh, where we can utilize such infrastructure for cross-border connection within Yora Delta? Again, not, not, an, not, a, not an easy question, but um, the water, specifically in the case I'm working in, the, the water is quite crucial. If something happens in France, uh, we have consequences in, in Flanders. And it's a very banal example, but two years ago, there was a huge leak somewhere in a, in a, in a factory. There was a pollution of the river and we had 90% of the fishes dying in Flanders. So this kind of exchange of uh, working together, dealing one with the other, dealing with problems uh, that are cross-border, and this, is, this was a, a, a humongous problem, uh, is extremely essential. So working together is, is something we actually need to do on this cross-border uh, on, on this cross-border teams um what i also need to add is that uh, what we're facing now with the water is in a, is extremely challenging uh, throughout centuries we have been constructing a, a water management in, in flanders that is uh, dealing with uh, draining the water as fast as we can to have dry lands uh, the rain, the rain was falling equally all over the year, so we had always rain in, uh, in Flanders, winter and summer, and we were always training to have dry lands, to have agriculture. And at this point, this whole water, this whole rain system is, is changing because of climate. We have wet winters and dry summers, so we need to store 
the water. And this means that we have to reinvent this whole water management, that we have to redo actually the whole uh, system of creeks and ditches and, and rivers. And that I think is the true challenge that is behind this blue park to rethink the, the way how we are dealing with water and, and holding it much more on the territory. And once we start doing this, once we start executing this, we will construct uh, automatically or simultaneously uh, large parts of the blue park. So yes, there is a strong uh, connection across the borders and two, there is an enormous task to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Piotr, actually. So uh, when uh, uh, you were discussing about uh, the mobility voids and how those voids can be uh, uh, utilized in uh, 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 more uh, functional public spaces. So I wanted to know, like, um, also, uh, since uh, uh, the mobility void is one factor, but also if is there any possibility that we can reclaim back uh, these uh, mobility uh, zones and give them more to public in uh, in sense because uh, now we promote more of a public commute rather than private commute. So uh, how can we really go ahead for future and reclaim these mobility spaces and give them back to public and more uh, uh, go towards the goal where it's a shared system rather than individual system? Um, can you hear me, by the way? Just a yes, check. yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that the shift in the mobility is very much uh, kind of driven by the policies. So in this particular case, uh, I must say uh, we also for this project, we were very lucky. We were working with the municipality of Rotterdam that is very much uh, motivated to move away from uh, the car transport, more of the public transport. So in this sense, um, every idea that concerns reducing the car traffic flows, uh, narrowing the streets and proposing more uh, pedestrian areas and cycling paths and kind of stimulating the public transport uh, is very much welcome. So in this sense, uh, I think as long as people, as we'll keep on having such projects and more and more municipalities and policymakers who understand the importance of public transport for, let's say, also the climate changes and its relevance for that, and, but also simply how much space it occupies, uh, we will kind of improving in this area. So I, I think this, this movement already started and I must personally say, at least I feel it in the Netherlands, that is kind of strong enough to in upcoming years to, that this shift in mobility will be very much visible. Okay. Thank and you, you Peter. Um, it has uh, some uh, relevance with the topography of Netherlands also because mostly Dutch lands are pretty flat and for people to bike around is way more easier and go towards more sustainable modes of transport rather than like up, uh, to the flip side in Germany, it's not as flat. So people, I see a lot of times people just don't prefer those kind of modes. And it's even when government do propose or give them infrastructure, people are not just utilizing that because the topography is not allowing them to do that. Yeah. Peter, we cannot hear you anymore. Yeah, this is obviously the case with the Netherlands as a very flat country to have the advantage of uh, cycling being a very easy transport mode. Uh, but I think it's not only about cycling. I think it's also just